Hello, welcome to another Staff 432 video. Uh, today, uh, in this video, I don't know when you're watching it, so today for me, um, we'll make the transition from regression to classification. Um, and hopefully the thing you'll take away is that there's really just one main difference um, and you pretty much have the foundations of everything we're already gonna do here. Um, I also hope that however many videos from now, I think two, when I start doing this in R, you'll really be like, oh, oh, this is just everything we did the last couple of weeks, but now with a tiny little difference and you'll be off to the races. So um, let's get started. So um, I like to start thinking about sort of like what this looks like from a data perspective. So uh, we have some data here and, and as always, we consider the Y variable the response. And right off the bat, uh, we see the sort of like fake data that I have here uh, is denoted by A's, B's, and C's uh, to sort of um, uh, hint at, well, these are categories. Um, and that is the difference between regression and classification uh, is that the response is assumed to be categorical. And I'm gonna sort of make a, a minor, well, what feels like a minor point here uh, but I believe to be a very useful thing to realize is that um, there's many ways to deal with, deal with categorical variables. When we're talking about categorical variables in R, I want uh, them to be factors. Uh, there are certainly ways of doing classification where you don't do this, um, but I like rules that both uh, simplify and unify things. Um, so if you do this, you're just going to run into far fewer problems uh, and everything we do is going to sort of feel a little bit more similar. Now, it'll look like I'm sort of breaking my own rule later uh, when mathematically we talk about, say, using zero for one category and one for another category, but that's just a mathematical convenience. I would still say in that situation, you, you still use factor variables in R for the response. Okay, so all that said, well then sort of our mission then uh, will be given this information here. So given this, what we wanna do is try to predict this. So that should have a very similar feel to what we did in uh, regression, except now in trying to get a number right, we're trying to get a category right. Um, how do we do this? Well, we want to develop a way to do this sort of, you know, automatically given some previous data. And then in some new data, when I only show you that feature information, you can hopefully uh, output the value C. So let's sort of look at this more visually for a moment. So this is not the same data, uh, but um, we'll talk about this um, now in multiple dimensions. This is one of the great things about classification. So we're gonna have a feature X1, we're gonna have a feature X2, and now uh, the response variable Y is indicated by the color of the data points. Um, so this way I can sort of like talk about two feature variables, one response variable in only two dimensions, kind of nice. Okay, so what are you trying to do here? So here's some data. Let's say now I ask you, well, what would you predict here? I assume you're screaming at your computer, gray, because um, I assume you're always screaming back at me in these videos because you're so excited to watch them. Um, similarly, maybe right here, uh, you would say blue. Uh, and here, you would maybe say pink. And if I asked you here, you would say, I don't know, let's flip a coin, I, I, who knows. Okay, um, and that's, that's basically what we're doing. Uh, but what I want to stress is that actually what we're going to do is an intermediate step first and then do that afterwards. So the intermediate step is going to be, so if I ask you um, what to predict here, you would say gray. But what I really want at this x1 comma x2 value is a probability that it's gray, a probability that it's blue, and a probability that it's pink. And then, you know, whichever one of those is highest, that's what we predict to if we have to but it's better to know the individual probabilities. Um, and sort of like here, you'd probably tell me high probability blue, low probability gray, low probability pink, and, and so on and so forth. So um, I just wanna get you to start thinking about that. One more thing I want you to start thinking about, although this won't come up again until way later, is 
So I asked you here, you said blue. I asked you here, you said gray. I asked you here, you said pink. And those are all good. I, I think that shows a good intuition for this. But the next question would be, what would you predict here? So what we're going to find is that many, if not all of the methods that we use, will say blue for this point here. And that's what a machine would do, um, given the methods we're going to talk about. But I think me as a human looking at this, visualizing it the way we have, if this is all the information we had and I saw a new value here and I had to predict gray, blue, or pink, my personal response would be, no, thank you. I prefer not to make a prediction here. I think what this actually is, is a very weird data point that needs much more investigation because all of the data we've seen previously is in here, but now you're telling me we're observing data out here. Something has changed. We collected the data wrong. Something is weird. Um, but just realize that's, that's going to be um, sort of a, a, a lurking fault in all of our methods that they're probably going to predict blue here. They're probably going to predict gray here. They're probably going to predict pink here. Heck, um, they're probably going to predict blue all the way out here. So something to uh, keep in mind. All right. So um, that's enough of looking at me. Bye. We're just going to go to the board now. Um, so how do we view this more mathematically or uh, more probabilistically? So we're going to say we have this X, Y pair like we've been talking about where X is the features and Y is the response. And uh, the features, uh, there are going to be P of them. Uh, and I, I realized that I wrote down that this is in, uh, you know, a P dimensional space uh, um, like uh, like this, but but really uh, the way I've written it here, it assumes that each each dimension can take out real va uh, real values. Uh, but really, those could be categories as well. Um, but um, just ignore the notation for now. That's not a, a big deal. Um, but the more important thing is the the possible values of y, which is uh, k possible categories. Okay. So our goal here is to find a classifier that minimizes this expression here, which essentially says the probability that this classifier that we have developed outputs um, a value that is not Y. So um, what we're gonna call this thing is the probability of a misclassification. So um, kind of makes sense, right? We want the classifier to output the correct value, not the incorrect value. So we want to minimize uh, this probability. Um, and so uh, I just want to reiterate that this C is a function that we call a classifier and it has input, which are the features. I don't know why I was pointing. Uh, I should point actually, but I should write it first. So the input is features and the output are categories. So again, our whole goal here is with some data, we learn this thing that we call a classifier. It takes as input feature values. It outputs possible categories. Well, one of the possible categories and hopefully a good one. Okay. So we're going to introduce this notion of the Bayes classifier. And I need to caution you right away to say that the Bayes classifier is not the naive Bayes classifier. They're two different things. They both have Bayes in the title, but they're very different. Um, naive Bayes is something we'll see later, which is a, a method that learns from data. The Bayes classifier actually has nothing to do with data. It has everything to do with probabilities. So what does the Bayes classifier do? Its whole purpose is that it minimizes the probability of misclassification. So this, I, this expression that I've written here is the defined to be the Bayes classifier. Um, but what it says basically is, okay, so given some X, you should classify 
the observation as the category with the highest probability. Um, I think one reaction to that might be, duh, um, that's like the most obvious thing to do, um, but it's still a useful thing to think about. And really uh, what we're gonna be doing is chasing this value all the time because we're not gonna have this information. This is information we would have if we knew distributions about uh, the population of the data generating process. But in practice, we're not gonna have that. We're gonna have data and we're gonna have to estimate this. So that's where we're going. But first an example. So here I have laid out a very simple joint distribution of X and Y. Um, so the individual cells are individual probabilities. So like this here is the probability that Y is A and X is one. Uh, and all those cells taken together, that would be the joint distribution of X comma Y. Okay, uh, sort of similarly, the row sums uh, are, so these gray numbers off to the side, those are the marginal for Y and the ones on the bottom, well, this is the marginal distribution of X. Okay, so for example, the probability that X takes the value 1, 0 0.6. All right, so the question we want to answer is, what would the Bayes classifier output when X is 0? Well, the first thing we need to do is calculate the relevant conditional probabilities. So these are conditional uh, prob of Y given X, in this case, uh, given X equal to 0. So when X is zero, uh, Y uh, is A with probability 2.5, Y is B with probability 1.5, uh, 0 0.5, and Y is C with probability 0 0.25. Um, and just to see how we got those real fast, so this one, uh, this would be just by definition of conditional probability, this would be the probability that X is zero and Y is A divided by the probability that X is zero. In other words, what did we say? Uh, X is zero, Y is A, so this divided by this, and that checks out. Okay, cool. So um, I think it's safe to say that this is the largest of those. So um, this base classifier would output B when X is zero. Okay, so that was kind of a lot of math to get back to something that I think we could have gotten to a lot faster. So I want to redo this, uh, except thinking about uh, X is one for a moment. Okay, so what, what do we do? So really, we just need to condition our thinking into this column here, where X is one. And of those three probabilities, which is highest? Uh, I'd say this one. And therefore, I would say we output C. And I can get away with doing that because to calculate the conditional probability when X is one, I would take this, this, and this, and divide by this. But because the 0 0.6 never changes, um, I can just look at the magnitudes here. So if I wanted the conditional probabilities, I would have to actually do some division. But I can just say, well, when x is 1 of this, this, and this, this one's the highest, classify there. But again, we would never know these things in practice, but it, it is useful to go through this. Why is it useful to go through this? Because now we can talk about the Bayes error. So the Bayes error is essentially the average misclassification when you use the Bayes classifier. So what did I just say there? Uh, average uh, misclass using Bayes classifier. And, and this here sort of gives um, the expression for that. Um, so we're not going to go through the whole bias various decomposition and, and sort of decomposing uh, expected prediction error here. But what this is, is this is analogous to the irreducible error we saw in the regression setting. So in the regression setting, if we assumed that we knew the true regression function, we would still make errors because there's some noise that we can't, you know, you can't predict noise, right? It's just noise. You don't want to predict it to be overfitting. So the same thing goes here. 
So even if we made the best possible classification every time, we would still be wrong some of the time. And this math, you know, works through this and we get 0 0.4. And, you know, if you just follow the rules of expected value here, you'll get the right answer. But let's, let's try to intuit this instead. So when x is 0, we're always going to predict y is b. When x is 1, we're always going to predict that y is c, right? So if we think about all the possibilities here, there 20% uh, of the time, uh, x is going to be 0 and y is going to be b. And 40% of the time, x is going to be 1 and y is going to be c. And that means using the Bayes classifier, 60% uh, of the time, we're going to be correct. Um, that also means that if this is the case, this is the case, this is the case, or this is the case, these are all the ways we're going to be wrong. And how often does that occur? Well, exactly 40% of the time, which is adding up basically the probabilities that we end up in one of those situations. Okay, cool. So uh, one more example real quick to, to drive home a, a minor point uh, that wasn't necessarily seen there. Um, so here we're going to sort of define things a little bit differently. I'm not going to give you the full, full joint distribution. But I'm going to say that uh, when y is 0, x follows a, a continuous distribution, in, in particular a normal with mean 5, standard deviation 1. Excuse me. Uh, and when y is 1, uh, x follows a normal distribution, uh, excuse me, x follows a normal distribution with a mean of 7 and a standard deviation of 2. Uh, and that's what I have plotted here. And the question is, well, when x is 6, what is the Bayes classifier output? And what you might do is you say, well, 6 is here, uh, modulo, you know, my art artistic skills. But, um, and so, well, if we look at the density of those two possible normal curves, uh, it's higher for the one where uh, uh, y is 1. So maybe we should output y is uh y is one right uh but we also have some other information here uh we have what we'll call later the prior probabilities so we have just the marginal probability for y is zero is 0 0.6 and the marginal probability for y is one is 0 0.4 so this picture only shows us what would happen if um uh x and y were equally likely but that's not the case uh, we see here that y is 1 is actually, you know, uh, ahead of time, less likely than y is 0. So we actually have to sort of merge these two ideas together. Um, and that'll be done if we calculate this uh, conditional probability here, which I've sort of started to do. I guess I should say that uh, f of oops, f of 0 is the PDF for uh, this normal. Uh, next to it, and f of 1 is the PDF for the normal with mean of 7. Okay, uh, and you can carry out that calculation, and frankly, I don't know what the result is. I'm kind of hoping that the end result is that we would uh, classify to 0 here, but I'm not sure. But either way, um, this is the type of problem we'll sort of uh, see later on. This is, while we're, while we're considering the Bayes classifier here, the setup is related to the naive Bayes classifier, but ignore that for now because it's confusing. Okay, so... Uh, all those examples we just did were impractical because we were sort of living in what I call probability land. So what I'd like to do is think about practice. And in practice, we don't know the conditional probabilities that are necessary to use base classifier. So what do we do? Well, estimate them. Okay. So what I have written down here right now is the Bayes classifier, but it's not going to be anymore. So what we're going to do is we're going to estimate this probability here. Uh, that is this here is an estimate of the conditional probability. Let's write as contraprob. And so this classifier now, I'm going to put a hat on top of it to denote that it's kind of a learned classifier. So we learned this from data.
And, and what this is then, um, this is what I would call a good guess for the Bayes classifier. So it's not the Bayes classifier because we're not inputting the, the true probabilities, but it's certainly a reasonable guess. But then our, our, our question becomes, well, how do we estimate these probabilities? And let's go back and, and think about uh, this picture. Uh, we kind of already talked about it, but let's say we wanted to estimate the probabilities here, right? Well, or, no, I don't want to do there because that's a little too ambiguous. Let's say I wanted to estimate here, right? So this should probably be a high uh, probability of blue and then sort of low on the other ones. Sort of similarly, if we wanted to estimate a probability say here, um, that should be high uh, prob of gray, right? Uh, and then something like here, should be high probability of pink. For whatever reason, the pink writing, at least in my preview window, looks really bad. So I need to reevaluate that after this video. Um, but then maybe if we try to predict somewhere like here, um, this would be hard to say. Maybe it should be sort of, you know, uh, a, a, a reasonable probability for each of the colors. Um, so that's a general idea. How are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna do it in R. And in particular, we're gonna use k-nearest neighbors, we're gonna use decision trees, and we're gonna use linear models. Um, funny how those are the three <laughs> things we saw in regression, and they're all gonna work again in classification. Um, and I have listed here some packages uh, that we're gonna use these things from. Um, but something I'm gonna note here is that using those like uh, K and N3 or R part, that's gonna feel really similar. But one of the things that's gonna be different is when we now use the predict function, we're often gonna consider a third argument, which is often called type, because um, that will allow us to, sometimes we wanna return these probabilities we're talking about, but sometimes we just wanna directly output a classification. So that type argument, it tells us, well, do we want this here? or do we want this here? They're both useful, they're both useful to us, um, but we wanna be able to get both. So that's why the predict function will have another argument here. And then I've said it before, I've said it again, please ensure that the response is a factor variable when we do this. Okay, so um, in regression, we talked about like root mean squared error and mean absolute error as metrics. Um, so here, what we would like ultimately is this probability that I have listed here, um, but that's not going to work for us. So what we're going to settle for is this expression I have here, um, which we'll call the misclassification. Um, sometimes I'll call this a misclassification rate. That is within a data set, how often are we making mistakes? Um, so this is a metric like root mean squared error and similar to what we did in regression we're going to have a train misclassification we're going to have a validation misclassification we're going to have a test misclassification and they're going to be used exactly the same ways um but notice um that there's that not equals there if we change the not equals to equals then we're dealing with accuracy um which one you use is sort of arbitrary um they're one minus each other. And if you're looking at misclassification, well, you want to select the lowest one because lower is better. If you're looking at accuracy, you select the highest one because higher is better. Uh, that's just a note there. Um, I also wanted to make a quick note about uh, notation because it could be confusing here that I have all these different sort of classifiers. So C of X is just a placeholder or some classifier. C hat of X is a learned classifier. So we learned it by applying one of our methods to data and C superscript B is the Bayes classifier. So uh, a C without um, any sort of qualification could be the Bayes classifier, could be a learned classifier. 
But if it has a hat, we're generally using that to indicate that it was learned from data. And if it has a B, that's the Bayes classifier that we're trying to achieve. Okay, so uh, one more minor note before we stop is so far we've sort of looked at classification through this lens of, well, the response is a category. Um, and that's mostly what we're gonna do this week. But I wanna note that going forward, later on, we're gonna talk um, very specifically about something called binary classification. And that's where Y is restricted to be only one of two values, uh, you know, one of two values. It's either zero, which we call the negative class, negative being somewhat arbitrarily defined, and, and one being positive. Uh, and when we do that, um, often notationally, we use P of X to be the probability that Y is one when X is X, because one minus that is the only other probability that is relevant. So you can do everything in terms of this probability that Y is one given X. And so what I've written down here is the Bayes classifier um, when uh, we're doing binary classification. Um, and so, so far we only talked about um, misclassification and accuracy. When we get into talking about binary classification, we'll talk a lot about false positives, true false positives, false negatives, true negatives, and a bunch of associated metrics with those things. Um, and I also think that th that'll be sort of an interesting thing to talk about because given uh, the, the global pandemic that we're in uh, and being at the University of Illinois where we, we've done what, almost 300,000 tests already, um, talking about false positive rates, false negative rates, these things are, are, are rather important. So I think that'll be um, a very relevant conversation when we get there. Um, I'm noting it now, we'll get to it later. For now, we're just gonna focus on being able to estimate those conditional probabilities that we talked about. Okay, so um, that's it. Uh, the next video will uh, talk mostly about using KNN and trees uh, for these things. And then the video after that, will actually do it in R and sort of tie all this together. Okay, so as always, uh, if you made it to the end of the video, good job, and I'll see you in the next one.